Good morning, good morning. If you feel like standing, go ahead and stand up and join us. Welcome you to the community this morning. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just 
just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break. you're going through, no matter what you're dealing with or how big it seems to be, if you can open your mouth and speak the name of Jesus, that thing must bow. Those chains must break. 
Those shackles cannot stay on you when you speak the name of Jesus. His name is power. His name is healing. His name is life. So I'm going to sing that one more time, and I just encourage you to speak the name of Jesus over your circumstance this morning.
Right now, we're going to take this time and uh, we're going to dismiss our kids back to promised land. And, and this is also a time of, of giving. We're going to ask our uh, ushers to walk down. If you're first time guest here, you can go ahead and have a seat. If you're first time guest here, you don't have to feel obligated to give. But uh, if you're 
regular, and you'd like to give towards what we do here at New Community, this is the time. I urge you that we come down. Thank you. morning. I'm not Cal. I'm sorry. Um, if you were here last week, and especially if last week was your first week and you really enjoyed Cal's teaching, I promise he'll be back. I'm just filling in for him this week. Easter is really rough for pastors. It's a lot of stuff, and he's visiting his family this weekend to try to sort of recharge. Um, I'm married to a pastor, um, and I grew up in this church. I started attending here, I just realized, 31 years ago almost, and grew up in this church, and so while I'm normally at my husband's church uh, most Sundays, I do get the chance to come back and visit and uh, fill in for a cow to give him some much-deserved breaks every once in a while, so I hope I'm okay, and he'll be back um, if you prefer him. Um, I love Cal's teaching so much, so I understand if you prefer him, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, I get to kick off the next series, which is uh, Simple Prayers of a Commoner. Uh, which is based, at least loosely, on Anne Lamott's book, Help Thinks Wow, The Three Essential Prayers. I had never read this before, but I loved it. Um, I am going to be talking about the first one, help, today. I am going to read a couple of sections out of this. There'll be some up on the slides. There's one longer section. I apologize in advance because I wouldn't normally read that much, but it's just beautiful, and I can't cut it up. So we're just going to enjoy it together. Um, so we're going to start with just basics. What is prayer? Uh, and so she explains her perspective on prayer. We're going to look at that, and then we'll look at like what kind of message do we get about what prayer is and what it's for um, from the Bible, and particularly from Jesus, and sort of see how they mesh. And then we'll move into help prayers in particular. So according to Anne Lamott, um, at the very beginning, you can see it's page one, um, when she's explaining what is prayer, uh, communication from one's heart to God. It's not for display purposes. Um, prayer is private, and we do hear that probably sounds familiar coming from the teachings of Jesus. It's not supposed to be a spectacle. Um, and then here's another section that's a little bit longer. Prayer is us, humans merely being, as E.E. E. Cummings put it, Reaching out to something having to do with the eternal, with vitality, intelligence, kindness, even when we are at our most utterly doomed and skeptical. God can handle honesty, and prayer begins as an honest conversation. So I especially want to zero in on that part about honesty. What would be the point of prayer if we're going to be dishonest and holding back? We have to do enough of that when we're interacting with other people. Um, ideally, we don't have to do it a whole lot. But with God, we should be able to, because God knows anyway. And sometimes that um, need to be honest in prayer lets us be honest with ourselves at the same time, with maybe some things that we were not admitting to ourselves. Here's one of the two things I'm going to read from the book that was a little longer than slides would allow. Um, so you can just listen for like 30 seconds to this. Prayer can be motion and stillness and energy all at the same time. It begins with stopping in our tracks or with our backs against the wall, or when we are going under the waves, or when we are just so sick and tired of being psychically sick and tired that we surrender, or at least we finally stop running away and at long last walk or lurch or crawl towards something, or maybe miraculously, we just release our grip slightly. Prayer is talking to something or anything with which we seek union, 
even if we are bitter or insane or broken. In fact, those are probably the best possible conditions under which to pray. Prayer is taking a chance that against all odds and past history, we are loved and chosen and do not have to get it together before we show up. The opposite may be true. We may not be able to get it together until after we show up in such miserable shape. And so this is a very fitting follow-up to Easter. Um, so when it comes to what Jesus did and his sacrifice for us, um, in order to fully accept that, we also have to admit that we can't do it for ourselves, which leads us to maybe God can help me instead since I can't do this for myself. Um, I, there's a whole lot in this book, and I think probably from our own lives, that reinforces that a lot of times the first times it occurs to us to pray is when things are really bad, right? Um, we're going to talk in the later weeks, or Cal will talk in the later weeks, about the times that we pray when things are good. But I think for a lot of us, this is the main time that it occurs to us to pray when we need help. Um, we may not always think to pray during the good times, to be um, grateful, to appreciate the awesomeness of something that has happened. Uh, but we do sometimes get desperate enough that even if we're not the praying type, when things get really bad, that's the time we think of to pray. Maybe that's not ideal. I think we're supposed to be working toward this being sort of a constant, regular thing, doing all three of these things, help, thanks, and wow. But if we're really paying attention to the world around us, probably we would be praying help prayers all the time, not just for ourselves, but I think that that's just kind of how we're wired up. That's how the flesh is. We think about ourselves. And so it's when things are affecting us that we're like, I need some help with this. This is terrible. Um, but we want to be shifting eventually toward doing that for other people, paying attention to other people's needs and suffering and praying for them as well. And we'll talk about what that does in a minute. But let's look at Jesus's examples of when does he pray? How does he say to pray? So that one, there's actually a straight up section in uh, Luke chapter 11, verses 2, 3, 4. One of the disciples says, hey, how should we pray? And Jesus has an answer. And so we all usually call this the Lord's Prayer. I think we have a slide for it. Um, Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And this is a, like probably not the super formal version you're used to hearing. It's a slightly different translation, but it still conveys it. So, Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. And so sort of translating those, we've got worship, uh, Father, may your name be kept holy. We've got, may your kingdom come soon, like bring peace, alleviate suffering. Give us each day the food we need, take care of us and our needs. Forgive us our sins, forgive us. Um, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, help us forgive other people. And don't let us yield to temptation. Help us not to be tempted to do the things we know we shouldn't do, right? Um, a few other examples from the Gospels of times that Jesus is praying. We have, um, he prays before raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, he prays before choosing his disciples. We'll look more closely at that in a minute. Uh, before and after the miracles that he performs. Um, he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane um, right before his crucifixion. He prays on the cross. Um, there's other examples those last two are actually the ones where we get the most details about like what specifically he was praying. A lot of times he goes off by himself to pray, and so that's what it tells us. He went off by himself to pray. We don't know what he said. Um, but those times, you do, and we're going to look at those in a few minutes. Um, so this fits very much with Anne Lamott's descriptions of prayer. Um, it has to do with like we're praying for like alignment um, with God's will, discernment, help, help me make the right decision here. This is important. I want to do the right thing. I want to do what you would have me do. Help in a variety of ways. Uh, you see prayers of gratitude. Uh, you see sort of the wow, the worship elements of prayer as well. So it fits very much into the way that she's explaining it. She's just kind of boiling it down into these three categories. A couple of things that I wanted to point out before we start moving into help prayers. Number one, the honesty thing. Like, it's not worth praying if we're not going to be honest, and sometimes we need that honesty. God already knows, but that ability for us to be honest and to really explore what do I really want, what am I really asking for, and is this something that I need help with, um, all of those things, we have to have that honesty element. And then we need help with things that are outside of our power. Um, admitting that there are certain things outside our power is kind of scary, um, and we have to have help sometimes. Sometimes that help is coming from God. 
Sometimes it's coming from us. Sometimes it's coming from the people around us. But we can't do everything for ourselves. So now we're going to talk specifically about help prayers. So I'm going to look at, and this will be on the slide as well, uh, this comes from pages three through four in the book. Um, it's just a really quick explanation of those times that we might start turning to God, asking God for help. Sometimes the first time we pray, we cry out in the deepest desperation, God help me. This is a great prayer, as we are then at our absolutely most degraded and isolated, which means we are nice and juicy with the consequences of our best thinking and are thus possibly teachable. And I like that last line, we're possibly teachable in that moment when we finally say, I might need help with this. I might not be able to do this myself. Uh, so we're going to come back to that. Um, I want to talk for a second about why I picked help, because Cal was like, here's what we're going to do. Pick whichever one of these three categories you would like to talk about. Um, help is the one that I struggle with the most. Um, and at least it is now a known issue for me. I want to say 10 years ago, I had no idea that this was even a problem. Uh, that I did not want to ever ask for or accept help from anyone for anything, even when it was really obvious that I needed it. I'm still working on it because I'm so wired up not to ask for help. Um, and so I find that when I come in and talk about the things that I'm still figuring out and struggling with, um, it tends to be better, mostly because I'm talking to me. If this is an issue for you, you can come along with what I'm working out about it. If it's not you and you're really great at asking for help, you can um, just sit there and be like, it took you this long, that's totally fine. I'll give you an example story, and a few of you may have heard this story because I feel like I've told it before as like that shining example of how absurd I can be in refusing help that I clearly need. Um, about 10 years ago, I lived in a duplex in Auburn, uh, old house, like 1930s-ish, something like that, uh, no central air conditioning, and so it was all window air conditioners. And the one that was there when I first moved in was not super great, the one in the living room. So I went out and bought a new window air conditioner so that my home could be bearable in the summer. Um, I lived alone, so I was like, well, I'll do this myself. If you've ever put one in, um, you're probably aware that that's not a one-person job. Uh, so anyway, I'm trying to put it in myself. My duplex neighbor comes home, sees me outside trying to like position this thing and hold it in place long enough to push the top window thing down and hold it in place. And she's like, can I help you with that? I'm like, no, I'm good. Why on earth did I say that? She clearly didn't mind. I didn't say, hey, can you come help them? She specifically chose to ask me, do you want some help with this? I said, no, I got it. She's like, OK, are you sure? Yeah, I got it. I got it. I'm good. Um, I didn't do thumbs up because I was holding it. But you know, um, she goes in, like, and then I think I've got it. And I let go of the thing, and it goes kabloomp down onto the ground. Um, it had a nice dent in it for the whole time. It thankfully still worked. Um, I also managed to cut my fingers on you know, the sharp metal things on the outside in, in my wrestling with it and so on. Um, why couldn't I have just said, yes, thank you so much for offering. I would be glad to accept your help. Why couldn't I do that? It's the, like, uh, there's so many other ways I could illustrate this. That one is just like the most obvious, like, what was I thinking? moment, but I'm like this with everything. I'm carrying a heavy load, literally or figuratively, and someone's like, hey, can I help you with that? No, I'm good. I got it. No problem. Why can't I just say sure? Um, I'm working on this about myself and trying to be better about giving over things to other people and letting other people help. One of my favorite examples recently of this, of the me just sort of being like, okay, okay. Um, I'm coaching six and seven year old soccer and there's these two twin boys on the team that are the sweetest and nicest kids you could ever ask to meet. And every time they see me coming, I've got a backpack on that's got like the first aid kit and drink bottles in it. And then I've got two giant bags full of soccer balls. And I'm coming down this hill. If you ever have been to the Whitesville Road soccer th fields for the little kids, it's a huge hill. They see me coming and they come sprinting up the hill every single time. We're going to help you. We're going to help you. And then they each take one of the giant bags that's as big as they are to carry down the hill. And they are so proud and so excited to be able to help. And I keep going back to that now as I'm working on this of going like they, they wanted to help. This was a delight to them to be able to do something and contribute. And there are other people in my life that would probably have loved to be able to help me that I denied the opportunity because I'm like, I got to do it myself. And why? Why am I this way? Some of it is my personality. Um, some of it's being an oldest child. If you're the oldest kid and you have younger siblings that are really close in age, um, you get a lot of your sense of self-worth from being able to not be a bother, to do things, to help. 
to do things for yourself, your parents appreciate it too. And so that can be part of it. Um, I would be the same way if I was a parent, like, thank you, oldest child, for doing this. So that's not a judgment on my parents at all. Um, I have anxiety and I'm a people pleaser and I don't want to be an inconvenience. And so I always feel like even if they offered, they didn't really mean it. I don't want to be an inconvenience by accepting that, even though really I'm probably being an inconvenience by saying no. Um, but there's also, I've learned this recently in a class that I'm teaching for the first time, that there's this larger cultural value we have um, in just individualism, this idea that we're all supposed to take care of ourselves. Some cultures are what you call collectivist cultures where your obligation is to help others. Like, that is the expectation. We're all in it together. There's other cultures like ours that are more individualist, and the value comes from taking care of yourself, doing things for yourself. We are all growing up in and living in a culture that prizes this do it for yourself. And if you ask for help, you're wrong, as opposed to a collectivist culture where it's expected that people ask for help and everybody's willing to do it. That's just what we do to take care of our community. And so it's really hard to push back against both a culture and that individual like tendency toward it. So like I feel like a lot of us are set up to not ask for help just because of the culture we're growing up in. It makes it really hard to do help prayers when we're used to feeling like we have to do it all ourselves. Um, but the whole crux of what Jesus did was we cannot, which we will come back to later. Uh, so when we talk about help prayers, what is that going to look like? So I've got a description from Anne Lamott um, where she just says, here's an example, help, help us walk through this, help us come through. This is the first great prayer. Um, help prayers, one of the things that they do is help us recognize our own limitations. If we finally turn to God and ask for some help, we have admitted we can't do this thing for ourselves. Um, but do we have to feel shame about that? I don't think we're supposed to, and I think the fact that Jesus prayed some help prayers too probably lets us know that it's okay that this is a normal thing that we do. So I'll, talk, I'll start with the one where he is praying for discernment before he chooses the, the 12 apostles. So this is Luke 6, um, verses 12 through 13, where it says, One day soon afterward Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. So that asking for discernment rather than just rushing and plunging ahead, relying on our own judgment, that is a form of asking for help. Um, there's probably, I know in my life, there's a whole lot of things that I should be doing this with that I don't. I'm like, no, I got it. I can figure it out. I can look at all of the logical reasons and I can just decide what's best. I'm not always going to decide what's best. Uh, but that is one of the ways that we can call on God for help when we recognize that something is kind of beyond what we can possibly know and ask for God to help give us some discernment, direct us toward what he would have us do. Uh, another example. So I'm going to, these are both from um, the prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. So this is right before Jesus' crucifixion. Um, I just finished... Um, at my usual church, uh, we've been doing a series um, with the kids and youth uh, based on the resurrection eggs. Anybody remember these things, these little plastic eggs that have little objects in them to help learn the Easter story? And you open them up and talk about this piece. Um, so we get to, I think it's the fourth one, which is the praying hands. And that's the part of the story where Jesus is in the garden praying. And for, for me, where I grew up, I, you know, I understood about Jesus. And, you know, I understood dying on the cross and... You know, all of this kind of stuff, like, I got that. I did not get the humanity part of Jesus until I was about, like, 14 or 15 and really, like, got into the details of the story. This is one of those things that is a big revelation to someone who is thinking of Jesus more in the divine sense. Like, Jesus is God. They've got that part down. He did all these miracles. But you're missing the humanity part, and I think that's really important for us to know um, just as... Jesus followers, but also when we're talking about and kind of thinking about what we can ask for help with and when it's okay, having this example of even Jesus is like, can we do it a different way, please? And the stress and anguish that he's under knowing what is waiting for him um, and how, like any human being, he's going to say, could we please come up with something else? 
um, we need to know that part of the story too, um, both to fully understand it and also to understand it's okay if we need to ask for help too. So I'm gonna look at two different versions of it. They say basically the same thing. I like that Luke includes um, some details that Mark does not, uh, but this is the Luke version, Luke 22, uh, verses 41 through 44. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. And there's some translations that actually talk about there being blood in the sweat, which is a physical thing that can happen when someone is under great physical or emotional distress. Um, all of this helps convey, like, this isn't just something he's like, no, nope, no big deal, it's all fine. Like, he really didn't want to do this. Like, he was scared of what was going to happen. And we need to know that part of the story, and we also need to see the part where he's both asking for help, could we do it another way, please? But then the follow-up of, but your will be done, not mine. Um, and Mark does pretty much the same thing. I wanted to look at the slight variation in wording. He went on a little further and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible with you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Um, so this, could we do it a different way? However, if that's not possible, we'll do what you need to do. Um, so Jesus knows what it's like to suffer and to pray for help. Um, and so I feel like if we're struggling with asking for help and feeling like it's okay to ask for help in prayers, I know I'm much more comfortable asking for help for other people than I am for me. But I feel like if Jesus could do it, maybe it's okay if I do this sometimes too. Um, and then there's one other one um, when he's on the cross. And this comes from Mark 15, 33 through 34. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until 3 o'clock. Then at 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, um, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So even Jesus in this moment is feeling desperate and abandoned and hurt, but he's still crying out to God, even in that moment. Um, if he's experienced that, maybe it's okay if we experience that sometimes too, um, but he's also showing what we do. We still turn to God in those moments. God is there listening, um, and God answers. It's not always what we think we want or how we think we want it, but there's still a God there listening, which is maybe the most important part. There's always an answer, perhaps not what we want, but there's going to be one. Um, there's two of my favorite illustrations of like why it's not just like calling God and ordering what we want, um, why we don't just get to do that, because that would be nice, right? Um, except for like once you start thinking about how this would work if everyone could do that, you can understand why that's not how it works. Um, if anybody's seen this old movie now, but Bruce Almighty, you remember the part where he's starting to answer prayers and like everybody's asking for things and he's trying to give everybody what they want and then it's creating just total chaos. Um, and another um, illustration I saw that kind of like answers that, there was this great show in the early 2000s on TV called Joan of Arcadia where this teenage girl is just being visited by God. God shows up as different people constantly giving her these random things to do that she's just like, what? You want me to go to the park and learn to jump rope? Uh, but there's always a reason. You always see it play out why she was asked to do this thing. She's being put in place to accomplish a certain thing. Uh, but there is, so in the show, her older brother had been in a car accident and was paralyzed and it's, you know, wrecked his life. It's wrecked her whole family, basically. And she sees God at a playground as a little girl. And she's like, why, why can't you give us this miracle and make him okay? Why can't you heal him? And she's just like, people ask for things all the time. Um, but if I just start giving everyone what they're asking for, I'm starting to bend the rules of the universe, and no one knows what to expect. Like, if somebody's plumbing off a cliff, and I decide, I'm going to suspend the rules of gravity right now, like, how much other chaos is that going to create while gravity's no longer working? Right, but the idea is that there's certain rules in place that allow us to expect what's going to happen. Does God break those rules? Probably occasionally. I feel like, yes, you get miracles that you didn't expect. But that's not the normal response to the things we ask for in prayer um, because it's just we 
can't, God can't do that. God could do that, but everything would be totally crazy. What if one side is praying for one team to win the championship game in the NCAA basketball playoffs, and another person is praying for the other team to win? Like, which one does God choose? Right? So it's, it's not something where we're just, like, choosing it and uh, ordering it up. Um, and Lamont uses the expression, or uh, what you select from the menu. It doesn't work that way, and there's good reasons for that, but that doesn't mean our prayers are not being answered, and it doesn't mean we can't ask for those things that would even seem to be like those miracles that we're not allowed to ask for. We're being honest. We're still asking for them. It's not going to hurt anything. We just don't want to, like, hinge our belief and faith on whether we get the answer we wanted, right? So two ways we would probably pray for help. We pray for help for ourselves. We pray for help for others. So when it comes to praying for ourselves, we might ask for some of those like external miracle things. Um, it doesn't mean we're always going to get them, but we can ask for them. Uh, so in the book, Anne Lamott talks about her cat. Her older cat, elderly, is sick, it's suffering. She knows the end is near. And so she is praying for a peaceful passing for her beloved cat. And she does not get it. Um, they have to call the vet over to their house to put it to sleep. The cat freaks out, is hiding fighting. Um, it's not pretty. And there's like 10 minutes of just awfulness as the cat is coming to the end of its life. And she's still wrestling with that as she's writing this book. And she's saying, was my prayer answered? Yes. Although I didn't get what I'd hoped and prayed for, what I had selected from the menu, which is an interesting way of thinking about what we do when we ask for specific things in our prayers. And she's still trying to make sense of it as she writes this, like, and put it in perspective. That was 10 terrible minutes. Um, but it had a long life of love, and she's trying to kind of like come to terms with the fact that she didn't get what she was asking for there. But it, when she looks at it in the context of that cat's entire life, maybe it isn't as bad as it feels like right as she's writing it. Um, and so it's not like we have these neat answers when we do these help prayers. Sometimes we don't. We still have mess. Sometimes it's years, decades. Maybe we never really fully understand why we didn't get that thing we were asking for, but that ask, act of asking is still important. Should we ask for those things? I feel like Jesus is saying, sure. Um, in those examples of his prayers in the garden, he is asking for that miracle. Can we do this a different way, please? He's asking for what he wants. He's being honest, but still submitting. I cannot remember if this example I'm thinking of was like a drama skit we did in here or a game we did in Promised Land one time or something, but there was like this illustration of how God answers prayers where we have like a wall and so someone would write something on a ball and toss it over the, the wall. Does anybody remember this? I, I know I'm not imagining it, but then someone on the back side of the, the wall would throw a ball back over. The, you remember it? Okay. Was it a drama? Okay. No, I'm not crazy. Yeah. Um, but they would say yes, no, and wait. And so the answer would come back. Sometimes it's yes, but sometimes it's no. Um, and we uh, then are stuck with figuring out, well, I'm going to trust that it was for a reason. Um, and then sometimes it's wait. Maybe this prayer is going to be answered eventually, but not necessarily on our timetable. Um, so we don't always get what we're asking for, but the asking is really important. Um, when we are praying for help for ourselves, a lot of times that prayer or the answer to that prayer is going to be something more internal. It's not going to be an external, like, my car dies and I'm praying, please, when I wake up tomorrow morning, let it be fixed. Like, that's not probably going to be the way that a prayer gets answered. Um, but a lot of those answers are going to come from inside. It might be some change inside us that we're asking for. It might be someone else pops up who they're listening to a prompting and they show up at just the right time to help us with something. Um, God's not going to break the rules of the universe all willy-nilly, but he does a lot of really amazing internal things. And a lot of the answers to prayers we get are coming from us and coming from the people around us. I still believe with God's prompting, God is the one making sure people are following this instinct to go to this place on this particular day. Or say this thing that they're like, I feel like I need to say something nice to this person. I really want to tell them this, but I feel like it's going to be weird. Should I do it or not? And then like, they finally do it, and maybe that was exactly the thing that person needed to hear that day. Like, all of this stuff is going on constantly but that we're not fully aware of, but I think a lot of that comes from our prayers for help and other people's prayer for help for us and for other people. Um, that act of asking for help is the important part. Um, there's humility involved in that. The submission and going, I can't do it. I've got to have help. 
Um, it's important that we don't rely just on ourselves. That is a really important thing that we all have to learn to do. And that is good for the relationships with the people around us when we stop trying to do everything ourselves and we let other people help us. And we trust them to do the thing that we're like, I, I want to do it myself so it's done right. Let them do it anyway, even if it's not perfect. It also is really important for fully understanding grace and salvation. The whole point of Jesus dying for our sins is that we cannot make it right on our own. There's nothing that we can do to make ourselves right with God completely on our own. It's not possible. We can try, um, but we're always going to be failing at that. That grace, the whole point of it is we can't do it for ourselves. Um, and when we really fully realize that, that like we couldn't do it for ourselves, that causes us also to extend grace to other people. We can remember, oh, I can't do it for myself either. Maybe it's okay if other people uh, can't do it for themselves. Maybe other people um, have further to go than me, but everybody's still working on it, right? Um, this is the one section I was going to read that it's a little longer. Please bear with me and trust that it's for a good reason. I liked this illustration. So she's explaining... Um, how she both does prayer, or one of her ways of praying, but also the way she explains it just works for me. Um, so give me just about two minutes to read this section. So one modest tool for letting go in prayer that I've used for 25 years is a God box. I've relied on every imaginable container from a pill box to my, gloves, uh, my car's glove box to decorative boxes friends have given me. The container has to exist in space and time so you can physically put a note in it and you can see yourself let it go in time and space. On a note, I write down the name of a person about whom I am so distressed or angry or describe the situation that is killing me with which I am so toxically, crazily obsessed. And I fold up the note, stick it in the box, and close it. You might have a brief moment of prayer, and it might come out sounding like this. Here, you think you're so big? Fine, you deal with it. Although I have a few excellent ideas on how best to proceed. Then I agree to keep my sticky mitts off the spaceship until I hear back. The willingness to do such a childish thing comes from the pain of not being able to let go of something. The willingness comes from finding yourself half mad with obsession. We learn through pain that some of the things we thought were castles turn out to be prisons. And we desperately want out, but even though we built them, we can't find the door. Yet maybe if you ask God for help in knowing which direction to face, you'll have a moment of intuition. Maybe you'll see at least one next right step you can take. The response probably won't be from God in the sense of hearing a deep grandfatherly voice or via skywriting or in the form of an LED lit airplane aisle at your feet. But the mail will come or an email or the phone will ring. Unfortunately, it might not be later today, ideally right after lunch, but you will hear back. You will come to know. When we think we can do it all ourselves, fix, save, buy, or date a nice solution, it's hopeless. We're going to screw things up. We're going to get our tentacles wrapped around things and squirt our squiddy ink all over so that there is even less visibility, and then we're going to squeeze the very life out of everything. Or we can summon a child's courage and faith and put a note with a few words into a small box in the hope that we can get our sucking, inky squid tentacles off things. We do this without a clue about what will happen, how it will all turn out, you may be saying, it's so awful right now, and I am so pissed off and sad and mental, and that against all odds, I'm giving up. I'll accept whatever happens. Maybe you put a note in the God box, you'll go a little limp. In that divine limpness, you'll be able to breathe again. Then you're halfway home. In many cases, breath is all you need. Breath is Holy Spirit. Breath is life. It's oxygen. Breath might get you a little rest. You must be so exhausted. With a God box, you're finally announcing to the universe that you can't do it, that you have ruined things enough for the time being. Imagine the burlesque look of surprise on the universe's face, the great cosmic double take, double take, then a fist pump. This is what gets everyone off the hook, the hook being the single worst place to be. My priest friend, Bill Rankin, said that through prayer, we take ourselves off the hook and put God on the hook where God belongs. When you're on the hook, you're thrashing, helpless, furious, like a small kid lifted by the seat of his pants by a mean big kid. Jesus, on the literal hook of the cross, says to God, help, and God enters into every second of the passion like a labor nurse. That asking for help is something that we have to do. Um, it's not just the answer to the prayer that it's about. It's 
the act of asking for help too and the letting go of the things outside of our control. Letting others help us um, is often helping them as well. And that is where community is coming from. That's where trust is coming from. So when we do these help prayers, it's not just about what the answer is. So we can also pray for help for others. Uh, a couple of other bits from Anne Lamott that I wanted to show you that sort of help explain this. Uh, there are no words for the broken hearts of people losing people. So I ask God with me in tow to help them with graciousness and encouragement enough for the day. Basically, there's, it's a broken world. Please help them. But notice the part where she says, with me in tow. Like, you're going to drag me along and have me help, too. Uh, everyone we love and for whom we pray with such passion will die, which is the one real fly in the ointment. So we pray for miracles. Please help this friend live. Please help that friend die gracefully. And we pray for the survivors to somehow come through. So again, when we pray for other people, we're not always going to get those miracles. We're not always going to get that miraculous healing that no doctor can explain, although that does sometimes happen, and it doesn't hurt to ask for that. If that's what we honestly are feeling we want to ask for in that moment, we ask for it. Um, but we want to know that the answers to prayers for others are not always going to come from God and from miracles. Sometimes that's going to come from us. Maybe we're the miracle um, that we're praying for. And that's the thing, like we're being honest. And if we're going to take the time to ask God to help these other people, that process is also going to have us, if we're really being honest, consider what can I do? Don't just pray and be like, it's on you, God. Maybe it's, let's pray for them. And as we're doing it, we're like, maybe there's something I could be doing. It might not be in my comfort zone, but maybe I might be part of the answer to this prayer. So if we're really doing this in an honest way, Sometimes this is going to be revealing to us the things that we should be doing to be answers to prayers for other people. So we can pray to God for comfort for them and to give them peace and to help them in their struggles, and that is a totally normal thing to pray for, and I truly believe that God does show up in those ways. Um, we can be praying for other people to show up for them and to help them, but we also need to look honestly at ourselves and decide maybe I need to be one of the people who is helping them. Um, and so then when we become the answers to our help prayers, we are helping do what Jesus was saying we should pray for in the bringing of the kingdom of heaven to earth, right? Um, so one more thing, just as an illustration um, from the book of her summing up how she sees these help prayers being answered. I've seen many people survive unsurvivable losses, seen them experience happiness again. How is this possible? Love flowed to them from their closest people and from their community, surrounded them, sat with them, held them, fed them, swept their floors. Time passed. In most cases, their pain evolved slowly into help for others. So thinking back to what we were saying about the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus is teaching us how to pray. Um, again, it's worship, bring peace, um, which may be us. Um, forgive us, help us forgive others, help us not to be tempted. All of those things, lots of help in the Lord's Prayer that may not always be obvious. Um, and so it's not only advocating that we should be praying for help for these things. Um, when you really start digging into what's going on in help prayers, it's also for us. It's a different form of help. It may not have to do with the answer to the prayers that we are praying, but we are helping ourselves when we finally turn to God for help and acknowledge that we can't do it all for ourselves. So last section from the book, and then I'm going to close us out in prayer. Uh, so this is from uh, Help Thanks Wow. We can be freed from a damaging insistence on forward thrust, from a commitment to running wildly down a convenient path that might actually be taking us deeper into the dark forest. Praying help means that we ask that something give us the courage to stop in our tracks right where we are and turn our fixation away from the Gordian knot of our problems. We stop the toxic peering and instead turn our eyes to something else, to our feet on the sidewalk, to the middle distance, to the hills whence our help comes, someplace else, anything else. Maybe this shift, maybe this is a shift of only eight degrees, but it can be a miracle. So what we wanna do with this first section is to basically consider, are we, doing help prayers? Are we actually asking for help and praying for help? 
Um, and then how are we using it? Are we ignoring those chances to be the help that others need or be our own help? We wanna both remember to do this, but also make sure our role in it is also um, what it should be. So I'm gonna close this out in prayer. Thank you, God, for being a God that we can ask for help, who made it very clear through your son Jesus that this is a normal part of our relationship with you, that we should turn to you for help. Thank you that this is something that you give us and that we can feel safe doing this. So help us use these help prayers to grow and help us use these help prayers to see the ways that we can be the miracles for other people. Help us see the ways that we can be doing the things to bring about your kingdom here on earth. Help us be peacemakers. But bottom line, God, help us just remember that we can turn to you for help. And that even though we may not always get the answer we think we want, we're always getting an answer. There's always one there. And that you are always going to be there for us to turn to. Amen. those people like um, Kristen that hates asking for help but I'm always willing to give it but it's hard for me so that message was for me too and I'm sure it was for some of you too um, we will um, give you the announcements right now um, we after service um, We will not be having after party. We usually do. So for those that are new here, uh, that's something that um, we do after services where you can get with the pastor and you can have your opinions, ask questions, um, just go over what the service was about each week. The next thing is uh, Women of Worth. The women's ministry has a Bible study that meets uh, twice a week on Thursdays in the office at 8.30 in the morning and online on Wednesday nights. So if any of you ladies want to join them, um, you can uh, talk with someone from the women's ministry. We have a grief share every uh, Monday. Uh, it starts at 6.30. I attend. So uh, I think we have about four more weeks of grief share left. Uh, if you've experienced any type of loss, not just death, uh, it could be uh, you lost a job, uh, lost a relationship, divorce, whatever, um, come and join us. Uh, it, it has helped me tremendously, and I'm sure it will help you too, just to be able to talk to someone, to talk through whatever it is you are feeling. 
So please join us at 6.30 on Monday night, tomorrow night. We have prime timers. They meet every um, second and fourth Tuesdays of each month at 10.30. So if you are, I'm not quite sure what the age is in order to uh, attend prime timers, but uh, if you feel you're that age, join the prime timers. Um, let's see what we have next. Um, if you're new here or if you have a prayer, if it's something you need, please ask for help. Um, you can put that on the connection card. Uh, we have physical cards uh, at the boxes in the back and at the kiosk. You can also go on the website. You can also go on the app and you can submit your requests to the church and we will do our best to answer those for you. Um, also, we have um, a singles ministry that we are trying to start here. And if you would like to be a part of that, you can meet in the lobby on the 21st. Um, and someone will be there to uh, greet you so that you can, we can talk about starting up the singles ministry. Also, we always need people to serve. We need we need people up here. If you like to sing, if you can play an instrument, uh, we need people in the tech booth. Um, you can learn how to work the lights, the sound, the cameras, do media, just move, to move slides. We need people, we need ushers, we need greeters. We need people to help with the children in the children area. So if that, if God is tugging at your heart, if you hear that little voice, if something just, just go right ahead. You can also put that on the com uh, connection card. So um, I thank you all for coming. Um, I know it's spring break, and I'm happy that somebody showed up today. So, <laughs> but um, be blessed. Have a good week. And if you need help, please ask. Thank you. Uh,